So my name is Artem Proshkovic and today I'm going to talk about the set core latest and greatest technologies and uh, so how we have used them on the one project. And so first of all, that's my second presentation on the Pittsburgh set core user group and thank you for having me again. So I'm very appreciated. And today's presentation, I'm going to start with short introduction of myself. Yeah, I have more than 11 years of programming experience where nine of them I've been working with Sidecore. So, and since April 2012, I worked for Bremit and currently I took a Sidecore architecture position. And uh, I'm Sidecore technology MVP since 2018 and uh, I'm living in Minsk, uh, Belarus. And um, I would like to start with short introduction of my presentation and uh, the the project that we have, was built. Uh, so my today's presentation was not to deep from the technical point of view. I'm just gonna share my findings uh, that we discovered during the working on the project. Some maybe. Uh, suggestions and recommendations that we also figured out during the working on this project. And uh, so this is not really big project. That's a corporate website uh, for one of the Sitecore partner. And uh, so initial requirement for this project just was to build them on the, based on the Sitecore SXA. And, uh, but if, after a few rounds of discussions, we suggested to build it using the latest technologies that even so we have not used previously and the, our partner was not used them too. And, uh, but as a Zcore partner, they're not limited with any licenses and we are was open to use anything we want, everything we want. So, and we decided finally, uh, to build this project uh, with the following technologies that should that should be we decided that it should be uh, a headless architecture and it should be based on the rendering host on the front end side so we still had the requirement to build it based on the sxa and uh, so finally we have to deployed to the Kubernetes, so which is Azure Kubernetes Services or AKS. Um, so that is my third GSS related presentation. This is not presentation, this is a third topic that uh, I presented since it was the GSS was announced by Sitecore a few years ago. And during this time, GSS term has undergone changes. and uh, now I want just to mention a few changes that are not too obvious, but it, it is makes sense to know them. So initially it was uh, presented as a toolkit. I mean, the JavaScript services was presented as a toolkit for JavaScript developers, which allows to build full-fledged customer solutions, uh, like single page applications, web apps, websites, uh, using modern JavaScript libraries and frameworks like React, Angular, and right now we also can use uh, Vue.js and being completely unplugged from Sitecore. And initially the GSS term consolidated tools and APIs such as layout service, dictionary service, GraphQL, etc. And this is still true. Uh, the service is still used, but in Sitecore 10, the combination of since was changed. And the Sitecore connected all JavaScript related services in a separate module called Sitecore Headless Services. And this module, module which is previously known as a Sitecore JavaScript Services server, provides a server side APIs and components which, which are required for ISPNet. Core SDK 
and uh, rendering SDK and JavaScript rendering SDK, which is currently known as a GSAS. So GSAS term currently is associated with uh, NPM package packages provided for React, Vue.js, and Angular. In the same time, we have like an .NET Core Core SDK, which also provides some basic stuff to uh, to build the front end part, similar as we have for the Node.js, but uh, built on the .NET Core, and it has some libraries that can communicate with uh, the services provided by set core headless services i mean so and we still can see that uh set core headless services has a layout service graphql it still have rendering engines dictionary services so that's still here that's all still here but it is called in a bit different way so also we can see Head core experience accelerator here and it also uses the layout service but so in this case in case of using experience accelerator the layout service is provided within the package uh, of sxa you don't need to install set core headless services separately in case of using sxa and uh, yeah so and when we talk about the gss we always think about about the JavaScript frameworks. Even for Brimit, we already done maybe four JavaScript GSS projects, but all of them was related to the JavaScript frameworks. It was React, Vue.js. So, but anyway, when I hear, hear the GSS, I think about the React and JavaScript frameworks, but Finally, when I started working on the my last project, which is corporate website, uh, I get known in new term, which is set core headless development. It was a kind of new for me. I have never heard about that. But uh, when I started looking at it, I, I just discovered that it is not really a technology. So that's kind of an approach that we use to build our websites uh, using uh, ESPNet.NET core rendering SDK. So and so the current diagram that you can see on the screen describes the flow and uh, how, how the application, how we can build this application. So uh, we still see we still see Sidecore here. Uh, there is a launch path which is not changed so uh, content authors still works on their workstations and connect to the site course through the launch path or that's pretty the same nothing changed here uh, so we can see that we have a developers here that's good news so we still need developers on the projects and uh, to build our dotnet core or rendering SDK projects, we need to uh, use the rendering SDK. So we probably don't have to use, we can build our custom clients to communicate with set core headless services like such, like uh, layout service, but set core provided it, so why not to use that? So we need to use the rendering SDK to communicate with set core. And uh, we need, so we still write code on the Visual Studio or maybe Visual Studio code, doesn't matter. We use the Setcore CLI. Uh, so we need to use Setcore CLI in terms of using Setcore serialization stuff provided in the with latest versions. So, and uh, if in case of using Setcore CLI, we have to install Setcore management services uh, to the Setcore instance. So this is, that can be installed as a, image using the Docker, or even if you don't use Docker and Kubernetes, you can install them just using the package called like set core CLI of some version, which is for corresponding version of Sitecore. So once you have installed it, then you can communicate with set core through CLI, you can run serialization, you can log in and publish and do a lot of other things, which is I found it useful. So 
we have rendering host, which is separate service, uh, separate web server even. So where we run our application and the, our and developers deploy uh, the rendering host stuff, rendering host code and assemblies to the to this server to the rendering host. And uh, in terms of visitor, when visitor comes to the website, the request goes to the rendering host. Rendering host send the request to the headless service. Uh, sorry, and once it it is got response, the the page rendered page. So rendering host render the page and return to the visitor again. So uh, now let's have a look to the uh, rendering host in more details. And uh, so the rendering host functions in in the following way. So the visitor sends a request to the web server, and which is which activates the rendering host web application. And uh, at the same time, layout service client fetches the re relevant content and pre uh, presentation data, uh, the model, the data model, let's say, from the set core headless services. And uh, layout service client, which is also part of SDK, pass this data model to the rendering engine. And in the same time, the rendering engine uh, renders the data model and your code and static resources into the final response and returns it to the visitor. So it looks pretty easy. And finally, it is. Um, one more thing that I want to mention, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we still had to use the SXA. <clears throat> and uh, and this time the ASP.NET rendering SDK does not support set core experiences accelerator renderings. So we are still able to use some advantages of SXA like uh, multi-sites management, partial designs, partial renderings, and uh, so on. We can still we can we still can build our websites using tenants using. Uh, yeah, the size defined as SXA, but we cannot use renderings provided with SXA, at least uh, in set core point one, ten point one. So, I, as far as I remember, I saw in the release notes with the latest set core ten point two, it becomes available. So, I mean, the default rendering becomes available with GSS. Didn't try it yet, so but that sounds promising. And uh, yeah, so that's a part of the project that we use and uh, that's good to have it. So it is easy to manage our websites. Right now we have only one site, but in the, in the future, our, cust our customer, our partner are going to extend the number of websites and it provides some functionality that make this things easy to build. <clears throat> and the next slide is very famous in in, in the core community that that slide was shown in a lot of presentations already, I think. And this, it, it describes the uh, the flow that we use to build and deploy our website to the Asia Kubernetes. I just want to say a few words here. Uh, yeah, that's kind of standard. So we use the same and uh, this part is sim simple. So developers write code in Visual Studio and do commits to the site core or to the source control, sorry. Uh, let's say to the gate or to the Azure repositories. So, and uh, once uh, the code goes to the uh, source control, some trigger run the continuous integration build, or even we can run it manually. So that's not really necessary to have a trigger here. So, and once the build is started, uh, the base images, which is usually provided by Sitecore for for, for Sitecore nodes, nodes, and uh, so we have some kind of other basic stuff, base images for the server, for solar server, for, for example. And um, all our code is built based on the, on top of the base images, and when build is happened, the new images are pushed 
push to the content registry, which is like uh, storage of images. So, and uh, this is our artifacts that uh, that we can consider as a result of our build. So, and when we run release or in terms of continuous delivery process, so we just uh, ask AKS or Kubernetes to pull latest images from container registry. So, which means if we nothing was pushed to the content registry, nothing will happen. So, AKS just skip this deployment process because all con all images are already uploaded and uh, run on the Kubernetes. But if we have some successful build and we see that and AKS see that new images comes here so that just run the deployment or just run downloading these images and once it is downloaded it start to set up a new instance so let's say we are deploying to the cm server uh ekes will download the image which is associated with cm server and run new cm node in, term, in AKS, and this time the old one still working so you can still you can use site core you can run serialization and so on but once it is new new cm server is run only after that the old one will be will be terminated so that's kind of uh availability that we have this aks we don't need to to so we, do, we all, almost don't have uh, the downtime in terms of deployments. But yeah, that's a simplified vision. Uh, so sometimes we need to build blue-green deployment. That's another thing that we don't build here, but we will in the future, I, I'm sure. Um, so now I'm going to just provide some imagination how the Sitecore instance looks in the Kubernetes. Uh, and this is currently we can see the non-production infrastructure that we currently built. So and the non-production so the, the non-production means that we can run the SQL server, Solar and Redis uh, in Kubernetes as well. So we don't need to buy external services to run let's say like a qa maybe or uat environments we still can run it within the site core as we usually do that locally so which save some money so at least for the licenses for sql and solar and Redis. so that's a good point so but uh let's start from the beginning we have asia and uh, we have a resources group that's all pretty common for any Azure environment. And uh, so the Kubernetes stuff starts with the AK, AKS clusters that we create. Uh, and usually we associate with some regions, so that can be like uh, West Europe, and North America, and any other regions that you want that you're targeting. So basically, and uh, in case of some scaling, you need to create like a separate cluster for a separate region and uh, balancing traffic between them using additional node here, which is traffic manager, which will route traffic between uh, between separate clusters. But in terms of one cluster, we have uh, uh, nodes. And basically, there are two types of nodes that can be Windows node and can be Linux node. Uh, Setcore can be run only on the Windows node. And basically, Windows node is more expensive than Linux one. But if you run the Setcore in the Kubernetes, you have to buy, buy, you have to buy both, both of them. So the Linux node is used as a system one. So you cannot run any Kubernetes cluster without the Linux node. But in terms of non-production, you can run the services like Solar and SQL on this Linux node. But uh, during this work in this project and uh, during my first deployment to the Kubernetes, I faced a lot of issues just because 
I had no, I hadn't have enough resources in terms of, I, I mean like CPU and memory resources, in terms of uh, recommended uh, uh, recommended node sizes. So the, the, that was a kind of recommendation for Sidecore. If you want to run non-production service, you can buy let's say standard version to node and that should be enough but that usually says the set core usually provided and basically provided for the XM topology and in our case we wanted to run exa exactly the same environment as we are going to build on the production and we tried to run XM oh sorry XP1 topology on the uh, nodes that pro that recommend by Sitecore, but we didn't take into account that it is probably for the XM. And once we run XP1, so we had not enough resources for Solar or for the SQL just because it requires more. We have more indexes, we have more data and so on. And when you have some troubles during the, the deployment, it usually says that you don't have enough resources to allocate some nodes, but it took some time to when I understand what what was wrong. So that may be my mistake, but it is good to know that you usually need to control the resources that are available for 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 node. And uh, inside of node, we have uh, pods, and pods it's like a smaller piece of Kubernetes data, let's say Kubernetes infrastructure. So and each site core role is a node in terms of is a pod in terms of uh, Kubernetes. Like we have a CM pod, we have CD pod, ID pod, and uh, rendering rendering pod, and all of this stuff is a pod. But we can say that we also have an Nginx con ingress controller here, which is root traffic uh, from external visitors to the corresponding uh, corresponding pod. And basically, it is this routing is built based on the host names or any other rules. Maybe it can be built based on the APIs and IPs. And uh, this kind of load balancing and uh, yeah, so that's kind of infrastructure scene that we can configure here. But yeah, let's say if we are going to to do the website, just HTTPS slash double slash like uh, corporate.com, which means that it is our website available for the visitors. The ingress controller will route us to the rendering pod. So, but if you are going to request like cm.corporate.com, so the ingress controller will resolve that domain and route us to the CM. So uh, all these pods communicate between each other. So they have like internal AP, APs, IPs when it is just run in the Kubernetes and uh, we don't need to configure it manually. So that works for out of the box, which makes things easy. So yeah, uh, to be honest, my first deployment to Kubernetes took like two weeks, but yeah, I have had to go a lot. So that require maybe a separate session to, to discuss the Kubernetes deployments, but finally it becomes enough stable enough and uh, we didn't get any issues with with using these environments in kubernetes and it's pretty fine so uh, the next image is like uh, about the production infrastructure that's very similar but uh, we can see that we have like external services so redis and solar uh, and it is easy to use search stacks because the documentation provided by Sitecore is basically uh, recommend to use the search stacks and provided some stuff how we can communicate with that and configure it easily. So uh, we can host our own SQL server or we can use SQL elastic pools in terms of Azure. So it, that's doesn't matter. So, but yeah. In this case, we have to pay uh, those external services. So that becomes more expensive. But from my point of view, that's in general, it, it is cheaper than just host the similar environment in the PS or even 
to the just uh, separate virtual machines infrastructure. So uh, we can see that in this case, the Linux node is empty, which is not really true. So in terms of production, we will move the rendering, the rendering host port uh, from the Windows node to the Linux node. So because the Linux node has also a lot, enough resources to run it. And in the same time, we will clean up and free up a bit resources from the Windows node as well. And uh, all nodes are scalable automatically. You just need to define how many nodes you are going, you want to have. And once the resources are reach some limits, then new node will be run automatically and uh, the resources will be extended, which is also good to have. We don't no need to think about that and control our resources. It is always scaled automatically. So, and uh, now I'm going to show you our solution and uh, how we have built it, because one of the first projects Oh, first question from the, our client was how, how we are going to build the rendering hosts and how we can we combine it with Helix and a lot of questions how the project is, what's the architecture of the project and how it organized. Oh, and uh, let me, so do you still see my screen? Okay, so, uh, let me maybe zoom up a bit. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that that's the standard Helix architecture. We have feature foundation layer. We have project layer. So everything is according to the principles, Helix principles. So, and in terms of rendering host, we have a separate project so we basically we separate in the our feature projects and foundation if it's required. So to the two type of projects, which is dot platform and dot rendering, the platform project type, the, the type the, yeah, the platform project types is include everything what we need for the site core. Uh, this can be, in terms of GSS, it it can be like a content resolvers, some extensions and the site core integrations probably. So in our case, we don't, but in case of we need you, you for sure you'll put it to the platform project. So we have the rendering type of project, uh, which include everything related to the front end. And uh, so we have store views here, we have store uh, models. So even we are build some integrations in the rendering part in the, in the .NET core part. So for example, we have like uh, Instagram integrations. We just pull in the latest posts from the Instagram and we decided to build it. Uh, this one part, another part is somewhere else. So, but anyway, uh, we decided to put all integrations that are not required site core. So in for example, if you don't store anything in Sidecore from, from some third party tools, we don't need to pull this data to the Sidecore. We just build these integrations on the .NET Core stuff uh, in the same with the search stuff. So we have some components that require some data from Solar. And uh, but usually we just send the request, we build the custom API in the Sitecore side, uh, use content, Sitecore content search to get data from the solar and then return back. In in terms of .NET Core, so the Sitecore looks like, uh, like an extra request that we don't really need. So we just can request solar from the .NET Core application directly and render this data which comes from the uh, solar. We don't need to send requests to the site core and the, yeah, so in the same time site core will do the same request to the solar and return data back to the rendering host, which seems like overhead. So, and yeah, we, we built kind of services for search 
uh, which use still the same .NET or oh, Solar Net library, which Sitecore use. Yeah, that's a bit simplify vision of the Sitecore content storage. We cannot do the same exactly. So, but sometimes we even had have more flexibility in terms of request to the solar because we are not limited with uh, the con Sitecore content storage stuff provided by Sitecore uh, assembly. So, yeah, that's our approach and it works fine. We just we use Setcore to configure our search requests, so we can figure out which, for example, in terms of block post search. So we in, we have a component in Setcore. We define in which keywords the blog post should have for, let's say, for the related blog post components. We're defining which uh, authors may be required for this component. So which blog posts. Uh, for which after blog post should be shown on this component. We're defining the search data, like conf we configure the data for this search request and just send the request from the .NET Core and render this data. So how it looks in terms of development and uh, first of all, inside Core, it looks pretty the same as a standard GCS application and standard uh, SXA application. Come on. We still create a component, uh, the JSON component, and defining their name. So after the component is created in Sitecore, we have to create the component in the rendering host. And for example, let's have a look to the components defining for the navigation, for example. And the, the main entry from the site core to the rendering host is a model. So we define, we just need to define a model and uh, the data associated with the component will be passed to the model and will be mapped to the model itself. So, and uh, let me just look the best example of model. Uh, this is a block. Block is not a good example. Yeah, for example, we have like FAQ item. So we have the FAQ template in the sidecore, which have two fields, answer and question. And we have to use the provided types of fields provided by sidecore so that we can see that it is a sidecore layout client library providing these field types it is similar as we was as we work with set core itself we can just define the type of field and use them we need to use them in case of we want to support the experience editor so uh, we can just use stream type here it, it still will work but uh, the experience editor will not be available in this case and uh, we need to create a model. When we create a model, we need to create a, we need to create a view. Uh, we have FAQ, and uh, we have FAQ model, which pointing to the. Um, we can see that we also can use mapping for relative items. So we have a template FAQ in Sitecore, which has uh, field items. And uh, yeah, we can map the, the the item selected in this field to the FAQ item as well. So that's kind of uh, smart mapping. So we don't need to define it separately. So, and when this model comes to the, we, to the, to the view, which we created and we have a FAQ model as an input. So we just render them. So we use some uh, predefined types of fields. It is very similar as we work with the MVC. So, and just render them. There, there is nothing unexpected. So that's very similar with, with standard MVC applications. So once we have created a model, we created a view, we need to let 
uh, rendering host how to map model to the component. So which which component require the model. So and it it is done by add model bound view. This is uh, like a method defining all our dependencies between name of component and model which this component require. So uh, when we will render FAQ component, so the FAQ model will be passed to the to, the, to, to this view. So in this case, we cannot do anything with data. We cannot prepare the data to before it will be sent to the to the view. And uh, but if we need that stuff, that kind of stuff, so we can use another type of another type of uh, views. Let's say so. This it called like a view component. That's that is a default uh, .NET Core type of views. So this is not really. It is not really controller, so you cannot. Uh, you don't need to think that about a controller, so that's a kind of middleware, which will be requested before the model will comes to the to the view. So you still have the the predefined model as an input for this uh, view view component, but here you can prepare data. You can do some requests somewhere you need. You can. In our case, you can do the search request to the solar with data which comes from the site core in the model. So you use model as an input data, and based on this data, you we build at least uh, the request to the solar, and then send the data from the solar to the view instead of the predefined model. So <clears throat> this model also need to be registered here. So this this view need to be registered here, but in a bit different way. So uh, instead of add model bound, we need to do add uh, view component, which also require the model defined here and uh, the name of component that we are going to map. So uh, we don't use it. We, we was going to use this view model initially, but we don't use it yet so that's not the final version of the project because i had to refactor and then remove the customer name because our our client decided to to stay unrecognized so i cannot even pull the latest changes from our project to, to my demo project but anyway so that describes the way how we can build it um so each our feature even or foundation project has uh, serialization stuff defining in the JSON files because we use the standard set code serialization in this project, which also fine. Uh, sometimes it is a bit more difficult to solve some conflicts comparing with maybe TDS or with Unicorn, but when it is built in the correct way, so when you don't have like a, Cross dependencies and it is, it works pretty fine. Even it sim simplifies some uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery processes because you just can run the synchronization through the PowerShell request, so that's pretty fine. So we cannot uh, sync and store roles and users under the content set, set core content serialization for this version of Sitecore, but uh, since Sitecore 10.2, it is provided. So this stuff is provided, so you can use it if you want. And uh, yeah, that's kind of cool stuff that we can use already. And uh, so in terms of the development process and Kubernetes, uh, the Rendering host has a watcher when we run our Docker environment locally, it, it is run some watcher with, which control every changes in terms of rendering projects. So basically we have like a project project of rendering type, our project layer, yeah. 
and this is like a main entry to the our rendering host application and this project has a startup where we're defining even all our models on our view registrations that we need to run during the start project startup so if you will just look at the, this method we will see that all there is all our uh, bindings between uh, components and models that should be passed to these views. So we need to, to put it manually. So uh, this is like a configuration for, for our project. And uh, when we do any changes uh, in, in the projects that are dependent, uh, we can see that all our rendering projects in dependencies for for the our main project so the all changes becomes available on the website immediately so when you change one view just save a file in in maybe 30 seconds that you will see these changes on the website it really depends how how big your rendering cost up maybe it can took like a minute or maybe two but you don't need to build anything manually so that that becomes available to the testing and almost immediately so and in terms of the sidecore stuff we need to build a platform project but it is pretty standard uh, environment project used by docker uh, in, in examples provided by sidecore or by community so we have the two serialization models uh, for the project we have like a content which is uh, should be ignored on the production deployments or in UAT. So, but we still can can identify what should be what should happen with content which already exists on the target location. So in our case, uh, we just create the new content. So which means that uh, we will not override anything that is on the you already on the UAT. So just don't don't interrupt the and break something that was done already by content authors on the UIT, for example. So that is, uh, let me look at my notes just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, yeah, so one more thing that I wanted to mention, maybe the last thing that, uh, so this is how our project looks from the uh, file system point of view. So initially, when we work with uh, Docker locally, we just need to have like a Docker Compose and Docker Compose or write files. But in terms of deployments to the Kubernetes, I had to create a separate XP1 and the XP1 overwrite YAML files to define the builds for our Kubernetes. So to build images for Kubernetes. So it is because just a simple example. So locally, we have to run the solar within the Docker images, so within the Docker environment. But uh, for the Kubernetes, the the solar should be like a separate service, and we don't need to run like a separate image for for our instance. And uh, for for my Kubernetes uh, deployment, we just build the ports and images that we only the image that we deploy so it is for cd server which is the image for cm server in the image for rendering host and identity server because we provide we deploy in some custom configuration for identity server so also we have like a separate build for init stuff that's usually used for uh it is used by us for setup our non-production because uh, the init stuff is provided the solar and the scale server, which is not re really required for for production deployments. So it is why we have it separately. But yeah, that's kind of separate configurations that we need separate Docker Compose files that we need to build for our Kubernetes deployment. So we cannot use the same as we use it locally. And uh, yeah, we have like a list of files required for Kubernetes. Uh, so here, nothing is pretty standard. So 
uh, we have a secret which is which just contains uh, the tokens. We can see it here: tokens that override and which we override during the continuous delivery process. So we set up, we set the secrets for every deployment because they can be changed and Kubernetes maybe always need to, to have the updated version of secrets. So and TLS contains just uh, certificates that that is required to for SSL and security connection between nodes. And uh, seems that's all what I wanted to show you. And uh, so thank you for your attention. Sorry, maybe a few additional words that I wanted to say. So again, uh, if somebody already work with GSS as a backend developer, it it is it doesn't have a lot of stuff to do for backend developers. Is it a simple project? You just need to create a few components in Sitecore. You need to maybe create a few content resolvers for the for more complicated components. But basically, that's just to create the components in Sitecore and all logic and all interesting stuff uh, moved to the front end side. And I heard from the a few backend developers that they are not really unlucky and don't not really happy to to be a part of GSS projects. But in terms of rendering host, so all backend developers that work with was working with me on this project. So I was mainly focused on the architecture. I didn't do some development of component development on this project but all of them was really happy that they say that it's cool so they the developers like to work with dotnet core that's something new that everybody just want to get something new to know but in this case we use the new technology the promising technology with the site core headless architecture and both part of uh team on so the front end and back end are happy because we still can use the React within the .NET Core. So we, we just can use an MVC with more simple websites. That's kind of flexibility that we can, that we have in terms of rendering host, but it really makes our team happy to work with this project. So that's a really good and that's really amazing stuff that I got a really good the feedback from the team in terms of this project. So that's what I wanted to, to add. Right now, I can say that thank you for attention. I'm open to for any, for any questions. Even if you'll have them later, you can reach me out with my social networks and just talk with me and I will help you if I, will, if I can. That was awesome, Artisan. It's a good eye opener for me. I have a new JSS project coming up, so I'll make this as a reference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so JSS becomes like uh, very popular. So we, we have a lot of requests for JSS projects, by the way. So that, yeah, that's true. That's right. A headless is the future. Yeah, so looking at the so many companies that Sitecore bought. So I think we have, we will have a lot of headless. <laughs> That's true. Totally. totally. I believe uh, also we don't need to know uh, new technology like React or other things to learn. If, if you can use C Sharp and do things, it's much easier. A yes, lot of but... existing developers, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, basically. So even looking at the new technologies that Sitecore will provide us in the future so in the nearest future so they also communicate seems like they are also connected by some applications that should be done for asia so asia services but they also built on the dotnet core so that makes sense to look at that so i think it, it, the dotnet core is part of our future as well <clears throat> not only the javascript but javascript will become will took a lot a big part of the project as well 
from our vision. How about the performance standpoint of these rendering post compared to the JavaScript frameworks in the headless? I know everybody is just heading towards the fastest web these days and just wondering, you know, the performance of the site using these. Uh, that's a bit difficult to answer because uh, we 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 are still on the way to 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 deploy it to production. So the project is not released, and uh, it is a bit difficult to measure some performance right now. But I saw a lot of environments, and basically um, they works differently so from the beginning and when i was just working with let's say with our environment and kubernetes and rendering host it is it is too fast so from my feeling that it is fast but i cannot measure it is in in, a, in the numbers so let's say and uh, i cannot do some exact answer for that but i think it should be fast that's good yep as long as it competes with the javascript frameworks sure But again, so that makes sense to measure the same site built on the and on the let's say on the JavaScript frameworks and the same site built on the .NET Core. Only this com comparing will make some sense. So it no makes sense to measure different websites built on different technologies. So that's kind of yeah, makes sense. Thanks. 